Hey, it's Jeff Young, Kinesiologist, and this video is on the variables involved in designing a resistance training program, which I'll go through one by one. And part of the purpose of the video is to explain that designing a resistance training program is more complex than designing an aerobic or a flexibility training program in the sense that there's a lot more variables involved. And this is one of the reasons why people should know these variables and the associated guidelines and why, at least initially, people should seek out an exercise specialist to help set up at least the initial part of the program. But while designing a resistance training program is a little complex in the sense of the number of variables that are involved, the cool thing is that most of them are already a part of a concept called periodization. So once you understand periodization, the complexity significantly diminishes. In any case, let's get started. Unlike aerobic flexibility and self myofascial release program design, where it's as easy as filling in five blanks, frequency, intensity, time or duration, type and progression to design a program for somebody or for yourself, with resistance training, the variables that are involved in designing a program are much more numerous and much more complex. While the variables can include a few more above and beyond what is listed here, for general and special populations, the primary variables involved in designing a program are frequency, both objective and subjective intensity, sets per muscle group per week, repetitions per set, order of exercise, choice of exercise, rest between sets, rest between sessions, and the repetition tempo. This video is meant to be a general overview, so I'll go over these briefly. And then in related videos, I'll go over them in much more detail. Beginning with frequency, the least amount of times you can train per week is one and the most is seven. I would never recommend either one of those. One is too few because if you're only training once a week, you're giving your muscle group six days of rest and it's just not enough stimulus to ever get someone out of a beginner range of strength. And training seven days a week is just too much because you're not allowing adequate rest and recuperation. So most people should be training somewhere in the two to six days per week range. Since it takes about 24 to 48 hours for your body to recover from a workout, depending on the volume and intensity and some other factors. If a person is training two times per week, they can set up their program in a total body format and just make sure that it's on non-consecutive days so that they're giving the muscle group some rest. If it's three sessions per week, it can either be three total bodies or it could be two split routines and one total body. For example, lower body on Saturday, upper body on Sunday, and then either on Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday doing a light total body. But once you get to four, five, or six sessions per week, then you no longer want to train total body. And at that point, you should be splitting it up into what's called split routine format, where, for example, you could do two lower body and two upper body sessions if it's a four day split, or you can split it up into push exercises in one session and pull exercises in another. Objective intensity just means that we're taking your feelings, emotions, and your rate of perceived exertion out of the equation. In other words, we're taking any subjectivity out of the equation and we're just looking at the load that you're lifting. So in the one to three repetition range, it's considered very heavy weight because it's the heaviest weight that you can possibly lift. If you can lift the weight four to six times, then objectively it's considered heavy weight. In the seven to 12 repetition range, it's considered moderate. The 13 to 15 repetition range is considered lightweight. And the 16 to 20 repetition range is considered very lightweight. When I was in school learning about this at Penn State, it would confuse me a little bit because I would think to myself, when I'm lifting in the eight or 10 repetition range and taking my sets to at or near muscle failure, it doesn't feel moderate to me, but that's where the subjectivity comes in. So with subjective intensity, you're bringing your feelings and emotions and your rate of perceived exertion back into the equation. And more specifically, you're looking at how close you're taking a set to muscle failure. The closer you are to muscle failure, Subjectively, no matter what repetition range you're in, the harder the last several repetitions of the set are going to feel, 
And the further away you are from muscle failure, such as in a warm-up set, then no matter what repetition range you're in, the less intense it's going to feel. And while I'm going to go over this in much more detail in another video on subject intensity, where I'll talk about what's called the RPE method, in a nutshell, if the velocity of movement of the last repetition or the last re several repetitions slowed towards the end of the set, then the set was technically a working set. And if the velocity or speed of the movement of each repetition in the set was the same as each repetition that preceded it, then it was a warm-up set. And it doesn't matter if you thought it was a working set. If the speed of the, or velocity of the movement never changed, it was a warm-up set. So while there's other variables involved in making a distinction between a warm-up and a working set, ultimately what it comes down to is the velocity of movement and whether or not it slowed. Moving on to the variable of sets per muscle group per week. For general and special populations, I like to break it down further into sets per large muscle group per week, meaning compound leg, back, and chest exercises, and then breaking that down even further, for legs, I'm talking about squats, deadlifts, hip thrusts, and multi-directional lunges, and also leg press. And for back, I'm just talking about rowing exercises, and for chest, I'm talking about horizontal pressing exercises like push-ups, barbell or dumbbell chest press. And the reason why for general and special populations, I don't include smaller muscle groups like shoulders and calves is because if you're hitting a minimum of 10 sets per muscle group per week for your large compound movements, then by default, you're doing the same for your smaller muscle groups. So as a general guideline, if your goal is hypertrophy or to increase lean muscle tissue, then you're going to want to hit these large muscle groups more often within the scope of a week, primarily because volume is one of the main drivers for hypertrophy. And if your goal leans more towards strength, then your volume doesn't have to be quite as high. But for both strength and hypertrophy, to really begin to get the benefits of strength training, you want to try to hit your large muscle groups and compound movements a minimum of 10 sets Per muscle group per week. And what that's going to mean is, for example, if you're doing three total body sessions per week, then one of those sessions, you want to perform four sets for legs, chest, and back. And then the other two total body workouts, you can perform three sets for legs, chest, and back for a total of 10. And if you're only training twice per week, and it's two total body sessions, which applies to a lot of gym goers, and please keep in mind that while it's better than doing nothing, it's going to be tough to get out of beginner range of strength unless you're performing at least five sets per those major muscle groups. The topic of repetitions per set can be pretty complex, but one of the main things to know is that for general fitness, the two governing bodies in exercise science, the American College of Sports Medicine and National Strength and Conditioning Association, recommend people train across the six to 15 or four to 12 repetition range. And one of the easiest and most logical ways to do that is to start in the higher repetition ranges, such as the 12 to 15 repetition range, and stay there for a two to four week phase where your goal is to try to get a little bit stronger at the end of the phase in each exercise than you were in the beginning. And that then prepares your, both your mind and your body to drop two repetitions, increase the weight accordingly, now you're in the 10 to 12 repetition range. You also stay there for a two to four week phase where once again, your goal is to make sure that by the end of the phase, you're a little bit stronger or lifting a little bit heavier load with each exercise than you were in the beginning of the phase. And then you drop two more repetitions to the eight to 10 range, do it all over again. And in most cases, unless you fall into the special population category, you would drop to six to eight reps and do it all over again. Or for more able-bodied individuals, you could follow that same concept, but instead of starting at 12 to 15, you would start at 10 to 12, stay there for a two to four week phase, then drop to eight to 10, six to eight, and four to six. This is known as linear periodization, and it's just a nice, structured, 
and logical way to progress from lighter weights and higher repetitions to heavier weights and lower repetitions over the course of time across the 6 to 15 or the 4 to 12 repetition range. Under the topic of order of exercise, generally speaking, you want to place your most important exercises early in the session and move from most important to least important. If your sessions are going to include explosive exercises like Olympic lifts, cleans and snatches, for example, or plyometric exercises such as hops, bounds, and jumps, you want to place them early in the exercise session when you're not fatigued and then move from explosive to non-explosive. And then also you want to go from large to small, compound movement to single joint movement, and complex to simple. And this typically equates in a total body session to performing legs, chest and back, and then moving to smaller muscle groups like your shoulders, single joint leg exercises, time permitting, such as knee extension and curls, and calf raises. Moving on to the topic of choice of exercise, the main thing to know is that while there's a million exercises out there, they fall into one of two categories, primary exercises and assistance exercises. And there's a very finite number of primary exercises. While some strength and conditioning coaches argue about what should be included under the umbrella of primary exercises, most people are going to agree that at the very least, it's going to be squat variations, deadlift variations, multi-directional lunges, pull exercises, or in other words, back rows, and then pressing exercises such as chest presses and shoulder presses. And anything that doesn't fall under the category of a primary exercise is by definition an assistance exercise. Historically, assistance exercises were used to increase strength in primary exercises and or to balance strength around joints as a way to help prevent injury. But unfortunately, in the world we live today, dominated by social media, one of the primary ways to stay relevant is to insert the newest, coolest, latest, greatest exercise onto your social media platform. And what that's doing in many cases is causing people to stray away from primary exercises and revolve the routine around assistance exercises. And the problem with that is that when a routine revolves primarily around assistance exercises, it's going to lack efficiency. Ultimately, it's going to be tough to get out of a beginner range of strength. And the person is really just going to miss their potential for not only strength and hypertrophy, but all the benefits that go along with it. Instead, there should be a method to the madness of programming for assistance exercises. And more specifically, assistance exercises should revolve around things like rotator cuff strengthening, low and mid trapezius strengthening, because both of them are great for shoulder and neck health, and promoting strength balance around the shoulders. And then other assistance exercises that should be included into a person's program are calf raises and then hip exercises in the frontal plane, such as adductors or your groin and abductors for the outside of your butt. And then of course we can't forget about strengthening the core, but since the core is already being strengthened with your primary exercises, there's really no need to go overboard. You just want to make sure that you include both movers, such as crunch variations, rotations, and side bending, and stabilizers, such as plank variations or Pilates mat exercises. Rest between sets can also get fairly complex from an exercise science standpoint, but for general and special populations, the main thing to keep in mind is when the goal is strength endurance or stamina, which means you're training in the 12 to 15 or 15 to 20 repetition range, Generally speaking, you want to keep your rest periods between sets with the same muscle group to somewhere around 45 to 90 seconds. And the higher end of that rest period range is going to apply to your larger muscle groups and your multi-joint movements with the lower end of the rest period range applying to your smaller muscle groups and single joint movements. But if the goal is not to improve strength endurance or stamina, then in most cases, Rest periods between sets is as easy as just making sure that your heart rate and your breathing rate has come back down to at or near resting level and that you feel mentally ready and prepared to perform the next set. 
as I mentioned at the beginning, it typically takes about 24 to 48 hours for muscle groups to recover from a strength training session. So you just want to make sure that you're strengthening muscle groups on non-consecutive days. And in most cases, you want to give at least 48 hours of rest in between sessions. And then lastly, on the topic of repetition tempo, if the goal is strength endurance and you're in the higher repetition ranges, you want to both raise the weight or lift the weight and lower with control. And the reason why is because there's going to be more time under tension for the muscles that you're training. And when you combine that with the higher repetition ranges, it's going to lead to more metabolic fatigue and therefore strength endurance and local stamina is going to be the primary adaptation. But otherwise, in every other case, you don't really need to think about tempo other than to make sure that you're lifting with velocity or at the very least the intent of velocity on every repetition and that you're lowering with control. But unlike what some fitness organizations suggest where they'll say things like the tempo should be 202, meaning that the lowering portion should take about two seconds, the transition between the lowering and the lifting should take zero seconds, and then the lifting portion should take two seconds. There's really no need to think about it like that because it implies the need for a timer, which pretty much no one uses, and there's really no need for it. So to wrap this up, one of the main things to understand is that there are a lot of variables involved in designing an efficient and effective resistance training program. It is not as simple as the FIT-P principle. And yet, despite looking complex on the surface, once you understand periodization and how it applies to both general and special populations, and if you're making sure that you're revolving your programs around primary exercises, the design of resistance training programs is actually fairly simple. So I hope you found this informative. Make sure you check out my videos where I go over these one by one in much more detail to give more clarity. And definitely make sure you check out my videos on how to design a periodized program for both general and special populations. So I'll see you in the next one.